Hello, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, Nilita Vachani here. It's actually morning in New York. Um, strange, I'll be speaking to myself for one hour, it seems, looking at myself in the <laughs> laptop. I wish I could be there with you in person to have some eye contact, to see how you're all reacting. But I'm just going to imagine it. Um, we are all in this kind of mode, aren't we, already? Uh, before I begin, I just want to thank uh, Samira and CDC, Daljeet, Bhasmang for putting all this together. I really appreciate being here um, and being able to cogitate uh, my thoughts about documentary film with you. Um, thank you very much. Um, just my give you a heads up that we might have a few tech issues today because we've all our practice sessions have been perfect, but of course on the final day, things aren't quite working as planned. Life, that's life, that's real life for you. Um, so uh, anyway, coming back to uh, today's topic, um, uh, the reason I chose it, uh, insider, outsider, and the reality principle in the documentary is because, well, in the documentary, we are always dealing with reality and in a documentary, unlike in a fiction film, the filmmaker is always part of the film. Whether or not your voice is heard on film, whether or not you're seen in your film, you are an insider. And uh, inevitably, not only are you an insider, but in order to make a film, you have to always be an outsider as well. So we play these, this very interesting dual role in the documentary. And uh, that has fascinated me always, I think, uh, ever since I got intrigued um, in this form. And I thought today would be a good way to sort of talk about that by looking at a few different films. Um, I'm going to start with my film, my first film, Eyes of Stone, um, which, uh, believe it or not, was made in 1990. So this year marks its 30th anniversary. So it's also... Uh, wonderful way, I think, to commemorate uh, that film. Uh, so before I made Eyes of Stone, I was already working in uh, documentary cinema for a good five years before that uh, at, in the editing room. I started as an assistant editor uh, with Mira Nair, and then I became an editor on, on documentaries. And I learned so much uh, being in the edit, edit room, especially from the pieces of footage that landed up literally on the floor. Um, that what was you know cut out of the film um, that taught me as much as what was in the film, and uh, when I uh, started thinking about Eyes of Stone, which for those of you who don't know the film, it's a film about spirit possession among women in India. Uh, I was fascinated uh, by the phenomenon of spirit possession. Uh, it really was a phenomenon and actually still is uh, in small towns, in, in cities, and especially in rural India, there are various forms of possession. And many of them uh, uh, are something that women in particular participate in. And I was very curious about why women and why young women. Uh, in fact, I'd, uh, I'd closely seen a case of possession when I was a college student in Delhi. Um, I was you know, studying in Infraprastha College and I was staying at my, with my grandparents and in their family of servants who lived in the back, there was this young girl who was exactly my age, but she would often be possessed by spirits and you know, then she would have to be exorcised outside in the driveway. And I would, that, that was my first experience of this. And somehow those images stayed with me and I always, I didn't have the tools to understand them. And I thought, one day, you know, I mean, in the future, I, d I knew I would deal with it in some way. I didn't quite know how then, I thought probably as a writer, but then I became a filmmaker and, and I decided to revisit that, uh, that experience. So at the time when I was wanting to make um, Eyes of Stone, of course, I didn't know anything about the subject. It was just in my head, really. Um, I tried to read everything there was on spirit possession written anywhere in the world. And uh, there were some texts that I read, not very many. And I also tried to see if there was any film that had been made. And uh, there had been a film made. And this was made in 1955 in Ghana by uh, the French anthropologist Jean Rouche. 
So, of course, I made it a point uh, that time in the late 80s to seek out this film and watch it. Now, Jean Rouge had uh, invested by that time almost 15 years in studying the Songhe tribe, uh, starting in Niger and then you know, moving into Ghana. So in that sense, if you think about his position, he's a French anthropologist um, working in Niger initially, which is a French colony. And he's uh, studying this particular tribe and their possession rituals. He's clearly in one sense, completely an outsider. He's part of the, the colonial regime that you know, rules uh, Niger. Um, but then as an anthropologist becomes completely an insider with this tribe and has, is privy to their, to their tribes and rituals. Um, so that's his background. And uh, before we speak further, I would like to show you a three minute uh, clip from uh, Les Maitres Fou. And the train starts slowly in the left foot then in the right foot it travels upward through the hands arms shoulders up to the head and the first man possessed gets up he is capral gardi the corporal of the guard he salutes everyone then he asks for fire, fire to burn himself with, to prove that he's no longer a man, but a hauka. When saluted, one of the other main shouts is Gerba, one of the penitents who was in the bush. Gerba is possessed by the Hauka known as Samkaki, the train engineer. The engineer pulls up his shorts and gathers all the rifles to carry them to the altar. The caporal of the guard is now wearing his red sashes. And the third Auka rises. He is Captain Malia, the captain of the Red Sea, who does a slow march, the parade march of the British Army. And here is the fourth man seized. He is Madame Lokotoro, acting coy. Madame Lokotoro, the doctor's wife, receives a woman's dress. The corporal of the guard goes on, saluting everyone. And the engineer shuttles back and forth between the governor's palace and the altar. This one is Lieutenant Malia, the lieutenant of the Red Sea. Breathing becomes heavy, eyes turn white. The possession ritual here is actually very interesting because the Songhe people we see are being possessed by the Hauka, the, so these gods who actually are personifications of colonial figures in their lives. So there's the corporal, there's the trade engineer, there's um, a doctor, the doctor's wife. These are your, all Europeans. These are, these are the, the British. So in uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, incorporating them in their bodies, there, there are two interpretations. One is that they're empowering themselves by becoming the imperial uh, rulers themselves. And there's another uh, interpretation that they're actually, this is a form of resistance through ritual, through performance, they're actually lampooning their, uh, their colonial rulers. So it's actually a real form of cultural resistance. But however, uh, it, the filmmaking itself is such 
uh, I, I have to say it's it's the film is made through such a colonial gaze that uh, that uh, sense of cultural uh, rebellion is actually suppressed. Uh, I, I never saw it that way. I had to read up on it to even feel that, that, that this was cultural rebellion in some form. Because uh, uh, Jean Rouge, in his role as a filmmaker, is like a repository of a kind of privileged knowledge. Uh, that only he can impart to us, the viewer. Uh, he is the mediator. They, we are the, in, the viewer is not invited to come into the film and uh, you know, interpret the symbols or interpret the gestures or the rituals. We are not trusted in that fashion. So at the end, even when there's a close up on, somebody, on somebody's face, with the eyes rolling up into the south sockets, we have to be told the breathing is hard, the eyes are white. Uh, so for me, you know, uh, this kind of filmmaking was actually, uh, in some ways, was uh, uh, underscoring stereotypes that we have of Russian tribes, you know, um, such as primitivism or kind of an inscrutable uh, behavior. Uh, so this was the only film there was on possession and it actually functioned as, as a kind of warning to me of the kind of pitfalls that ethnographic filmmaking so-called can fall into. And uh, even though I'm not an anthropologist and I was certainly not intending to make an ethnographic film with Eyes of Stone, because of the nature of the subject, because it is about the rituals and you know, folklore and mythologies around possession, I knew that uh, you know there would inevitably be uh, comparisons made with ethnographic film. So, um, so this was something that was like a kind of warning to me. Um, there was another film I saw uh, in the late 80s, which however, also made by an anthropologist, which however was very different. And uh, this is a film by Robert Gardner called Forest of Bliss, a film he made in Banaras. And uh, unlike Les Maîtres Fous, Forest of Bliss has no words spoken at all by the filmmaker. Uh, uh, there are words spoken, but they are diegetic words that come from the screen, from the priests he films, from people chanting. And the film uh, has a poetic dimension, uh, which really spoke to me because through motifs, through symbols, both visual and oral, and through their repetitive use in the film, uh, Gardner makes a film of great metaphysical beauty uh, that for me really captured the spirit of Banaras. So uh, I knew that was more the direction I definitely was going to move in. And so I uh, uh, made Eyes of Stone and I, I am not from that milieu. I am not the kind of uh, person who would get possessed by spirits or go to a mandir to get cured. I mean, if for my inner, if I have inner demons, I would go to a shrink, I would go to a therapist. So in that sense, I was completely an outsider. But I was determined to completely understand this culture in every possible way. And I spent a year doing field work. Um, uh, and by that, I mean, I traveled to temples in the north, which were renowned for uh, possession and exorcism. I stayed in dharamshalas. Um, I tried to meet as many families who had a case of possession in their midst, tried to follow the families, tried to follow the stories. I also went to Sufi shrines, which uh, have, uh, which cure cases of possession. And after uh, you know, a, a sort of a year worth of this kind of research with all these images and stories and case histories with things mulling in my head uh, and formulating into something. That's when I, you know, we, we made um, Eyes of Stone. And here I just want to, you know, shout, give my crew a shout out uh, because you know, no film is made alone. Uh, it could never have been made without Bengalis Kalambakas who shot this film in the most beautiful way. Um, Suresh Rajamani, who did sound, um, Gopal Acharya, who was our translator and who helped me figure out some of the very difficult speaking in tongue um, speech that the spirits actually use when they're in the bodies of um, the women. And I edit, edited the film. So um, 
uh, I just would like to show you a kind of longish um, stretch from Eyes of Stone uh, to give you a sense of how I was approaching it. I did not want to make an ethnographic film. I did not want to convey any information to you in a very obvious fashion, but I did create signposts, which I hoped the audience would pick up, then come into my film, engage with the material and decode meaning um, for themselves. So I'd like to um, play uh, a scene from Eyes of Stone. This is in the beginning of the film and it sort of sets up the temple.
आए मामा जोर दे रहे अल्लाह की सौगन बस हम जाते Um, my intention with Eyes of Stone was to create a completely immersive experience for the audience of the film. Um, I wanted the audience to be able to step into this world, which is completely alien, yes, bizarre, yes, shocking. But I wanted uh, the film to resonate at different levels so that this, the extraordinary in it becomes completely ordinary to you. And you are able to understand the film at then at different levels, both in the sacred level and in the profane level, in some sense. Uh, and that happens gradually over the course of the film. You know, so what might seem very strange in the beginning, later on, I hope you get a kind of you 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 get an understanding for what is happening. That that was the way I we we shot the film, and certainly the way I constructed the film in the editing, and. Um, I became such an insider in the world of this film that uh, eventually things became very, very intuitive. The young woman you see in the film, Shanta, uh, I, met, I met her the, the same way that you see her in the film. She's completely unknowable. She's ill. She's in trance. Uh, she is uh, shunning her child. Um, her mother is there taking care of her. And you see the absolute sense of exhaustion and de almost despair or, uh, you know, ennui in Shanta's face when she picks up her child and puts the child on her lap and immediately the child is quiet, right? Um, so, so these are, I think any one of us can appreciate that and feel that moment. And, and that's how the film really develops. Um, there was... Uh, the, 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 there was a time when uh, I became so close to Shanta, it became so much in my head that I could an almost anticipate what would happen. And there's a, a scene later on in, towards the end of the film where she's cured, actually. She's, her demons have been exorcised, uh, the bhut and the darkini, and she's cured and she's back home with her family. And the husband, her husband, who's a truck driver and who's never there, and who hasn't been there for the last, you know, several weeks. So she's been staying with her parents and her brother and her mother are taking her for this pilgrimage to this temple. Finally, the husband comes back to pick her up, take her home. And he speaks to her in such a crude manner, uh, saying that if you want to come with me, you come now, you get into the truck or you can stay here. I don't care. I don't care about you or the children. And I mean, the way he speaks to her, um, it, it's a scene we managed to film, and that, sh and she was so um, both enraged 
and so helpless that I could actually predict uh, a possession that would happen, uh, which was a possession that only happens when somebody is cured, uh, when the goddess comes and possesses you. Uh, and so I want to just show this clip. Uh, uh, it's towards the end of the film. And uh, the, the husband has come home and he's chatting with the family. And I had told Vingelis, the cameraman, even though we were very short on film, this is 16 millimeter, by the way, back then. I mean, to keep filming Shanta when she prays, because I had such a strong intuition that something would happen. And that is how we actually got managed to get this scene. So here goes, let's give it a shot and hope for the best. All right. Um. <laughs> तुम्हें दिल्ली में भरन क्या? दन्ने पी दारु एक आदो गाड़ी चला एक आद में बोतल बोतल पी तो जा निम्बड़ा यार एक नोकल गाड़ी आई ट्रक ट्रक लाल दो गाड़ी पहली क्रॉस होगी एक गाड़ी और क्रॉस भी तो वहाँ का मतलब टक्कर लाएगी वे दारु के में वो मैं क्यों स्टार गाड़ी के लाए गाड़ी ने एक साइड में खड़ी बेटे क्या बात है तेरे को दिखता नहीं कि मेरी गाड़ी के लगा दी मैंने कहा यार मैं नहीं चला रहा था ये चला रहा कौन है इधर वो नीचे उतरने की क्या बात है गाड़ी को आप कैसे मार दी मारी क्या साब ये बात है ये ड्राइवर चला रहा था अभी मतलब इसका आस आप नहीं है मैं कि झूठ मत बोल मैं कि � जो मैं वहाँ गिरा तो हो गया जूता मैंने खोना हाँ गाड़ी का हाँ जूता हमारे खोआ बाकी है मैंने डिया मैं चलाई नहीं हूँ वो आपने हिंदू बिंदु हो सार दा ड्रेस में लौड़ो जो चली तो मैं क्या रहूँ मैं तो आपका ये नहीं राजस्थान का हूँ मैं नहीं ये गाड़ी के ये चला रहा था पच्चीवाँ माँग आगे निकल दी तो ये आगे होता है। Look 
कार्ड बना दिए अब मैं माफी मांग लेती ना कोई ना के मारे तेरी डब्बा ही हो गुन्नो कार्ड पर बता बनाई के भाई वो गुन्नो हो थारो हां चुन तो दुख पायो वो तेरी दुख पई आ पता हो नहीं ओ देखियो माता जी का भोग काल का बुर्ज में लाऊं का हां जो जी हैं जो जी थाने लगे कोने वाले वो दूजी जी नहीं नहीं वो दूसरी um so this scene uh was uh it always strikes me that we were so fortunate to get it um but again it was because i was so intuitively inside uh, shanta's head by that time and i realized she was so unhappy that day and she was so helpless she was a 19 year old girl married at the age of 10 given birth to three children um at the mercy of this truck driver husband and her in-laws with no recourse um in this stringently patriarchal system the only recourse is bhankya mata the goddess when she's ill when she's unhappy when she seeks the change in her life it's only bhankya mata and here because the mata enters her in that tiny space the husband is actually apologizing for drinking for eating meat for not to letting her see the room that he's rented not getting her approval i mean these mundane everyday domestic issues are resolved at this kind of metaphysical level so um so this is what uh, this is how eyes of stone works and i really what i want is the viewer to step into the film become an insider and make meaning for themselves you know be the fabricators of meaning in their own terms um so but from now i know we i have so little time i don't even know let me just uh, ask uh, um samira i mean i i think of i may extend okay uh, i'll try to go very quickly ahead so um what i uh, uh, recently i mean now of course we have wonderful digital equipment you have cameras that one person can use um and uh, of late whenever i have shown eyes of stone uh publicly i have tried to program my film with the film of a very young filmmaker named pushpa rawat her film nirnay that she made in 2012 in collaboration with her mentor anupama shrinivasan um the reason i i love to show nirnay is because for me nirnay symbolizes somebody like shanta in my film picking up a camera and turning it to her own world so shanta making a film about herself and her friends and even though in nirnay there is no spirit possession the young women we meet in nirnay are exactly the kind of young woman shanta was you know in the late 80s she would now have been a lower middle class young woman um in in nirne all the women we meet are equally trapped as trapped as shanta is they cannot make basic decisions about their lives who who they will want to marry when they want to marry whether or not they want to have children and what they want to do with their lives none of those decisions they are able to make and uh, pushpa rawat is this very interesting person because she is completely from that milieu uh, she has her boyfriend a uh, boyfriend whom she is in love with and wants to marry she is not allowed to marry him the film starts with that premise with us knowing that so we i'm not giving anything away here she is not being allowed to marry her love because he belongs to a higher caste so she is it's her world we see and she picks she picks up the camera but in picking up the camera she actually walks outside her world and is able to look at it that's why i think the film is so powerful um i want to share a just a two minute clip from nirne and to give you a sense of a brief context she has already at the very beginning of the film tried to talk to her mother about why this marriage is not being allowed and the mother just will not give her the time of day and basically sort of says that you should be washing clothes instead instead of picking up a camera uh, then pushpa uh, talks to her brother who's younger than her but just shoes her away like a fly 
uh, will not talk to her. And then she talks to her father, who actually does talk to her, but in an extremely irritable manner, and uh, says that, of course, he couldn't allow this marriage to proceed because they were higher caste. And if she married this boy, how would he ever be able to live in his community? So after those interviews, uh, what, uh, what the camera does is here we see um, Pushpa Rawat actually speaking to her boyfriend. बताइए क्या सोचा है आपने क्या सोचा आप क्या सोच रहे हैं क्यों और आपके घर वाले वो कैसे मानेंगे क्योंकि मैंने ये मौका दिया था ना अगर मिल जाता तो ना हुआ तो फिर क्या क्यों फिर कौन मना करेगा फिर से कंडीशन लगा दी तो दबार थोड़ा मान कर आएंगे वहाँ से नीचे मत फिर जाओ क्या फर्क पड़ता है So um, I find that this few minutes of uh, film so powerful and uh, really beautiful in its intimacy because, of course, uh, Sunil, the boyfriend, when he looks at the camera and talks, he's not talking to the camera. He's talking to the person behind the camera, the, the woman he loves. And uh, that gaze that we see, his gaze at the camera is, I think, very few, you know, very, very, very little have I ever seen that gaze on the screen because it's so full of his naked emotion. And uh, even though technically you might say she's a first time uh, filmmaker, you know, she doesn't even have an external mic. You can barely hear him, but it doesn't matter. It's because of the nature of that equipment that he is really talking to her. He's not talking to a filmmaker. And I find it so moving when she's, you know, walking into the water and he's like telling her to be careful. And she says, what does it matter, right? So here the filmmaker is completely an insider. And because of that, we as an audience are privileged to this very intimate moment between two people, which it would have been impossible to capture any other way. Um, but yet it's interesting when you see Nirnen and I really think everyone should if you haven't, um, when her friends themselves point out very often in, in, in the film that she, she has, Pushpa Rawat has actually become an outsider and become empowered because she is wielding the camera. Um, so now this kind of first person ethnography, first person filmmaking is not new. It's very new in India. I think this is the first time I've seen it in, in, in Nirne, but it has a long tradition. And of course the classic film in, in this genre is Ross McIlvey's Sherman's March, uh, made in 1986, where he marches off with his camera through the southern states, uh, following uh, in a very clever trope, the march of uh, General Sherman, who was marching uh, with the Union Army against the Confederate straight, straight, uh, straight, uh, states. Excuse me. Um, but Ross McKilvey 
has a different project in mind. He wants to use the camera to get himself a girlfriend because he's just been dumped by his girlfriend. And so he behind the camera, you know, uh, opens uh, all kinds of very interesting doors. Now I did have a wonderful scene to show from there. All right, we'll see Sherman's March. Um, okay. The next day, Mary has to leave, and I go to say goodbye. Bye. Bye. For a long time, I've had this notion that love was possible. I mean, romantic love, you know, two people falling deeply in love with each other and somehow managing to stay together for more than two weeks. But time after time, it seems that a woman would get involved with me and want some sort of commitment, and I would decide that it wasn't right or vice versa. And no matter how passionate things were in the beginning, there was never any equilibrium and nothing ever seemed to last. At any rate, I find myself slipping back into listless contemplation of my single status, but Anne, my stepmother, has made other plans for me. She's grown up and been raised in the South, and you're going to love her. This lady is, is a, from Salisbury, and what are you grimacing about? I'm not grimacing. Yeah. I'm not. I have to squint sometimes. Oh, okay. No, but I think she's attractive. She's good looking. Mm -hmm. She sounds very smart. This is Ross Oh, I've seen it, huh? By coincidence, she's the same woman I've already filmed swimming in the lake and later roller skating. Her name is Pat, and she's visiting her parents, but she lives in New York City where she's been trying to find work as a movie actress. We have a few drinks and take in the musical entertainment. And then she asked me to film her doing her cellulite exercises. And I agree to do so, although I'm not exactly sure what cellulite is. Actually, this is supposed to get rid of the cottage cheese on the back of your legs like this. See the cottage cheese? Yeah. That's the cellulite. Yeah. <laughs> Show me these exercises. <laughs> Okay. Let's see, I'd do them a lot better if I had on some underpants. I believe you. Actually, it's harder than it looks. You have to just keep going up and down. Here, for some reason, I accidentally turn off my tape recorder. It's three in the morning and I can't sleep. I keep wondering how I should have responded to Pat's comment about not wearing any underpants. I mean, that's not like telling someone that you're not wearing any socks. Also, I've begun having my dreams about nuclear war again. I hardly ever think about nuclear war during the day, but during certain times of my life, I'll dream about it for several nights in a row. So, Sherman's March, you know, becomes a completely cult film, right? Um, it's hilarious. Uh, it's very new, very different. Um, and here we see uh, Ross McKilvey both being completely inside his film and then removing himself, becoming an outsider so he can comment on the proceedings, you know, so the film has this reflexive air about it. Um, but if you, if you notice, uh, what, what brings the audience completely into the fabric of the film, you know, why our spectatorial engagement is so absolute, is little things uh, like his stepmother saying to him, why are you grimacing? And he says, oh, well, you know, I have to squint sometimes. I mean, this kind of thing normally would be cut out and would land up on the, you know, on the floor of a cutting room in 1986. But he puts it in because it actually reinforces the rea reality principle. And for those of us who, you know, are filmmakers or camera, camera people, you know that he's, got, he's pressing his eye against the viewfinder. So, of course, he's squinting. But to the stepmother, she doesn't understand why he's looking so strange. So the immediacy of that encounter between a spontaneous encounter between the camera and the stepmother and then Pat, who proceeds to do the cellulite exercise, is just 
completely incredible, actually. Um, and uh, what I find very interesting is how then, you know, um, in many se sections of the film, Ross McKilvey sets up the camera, looks into it, talks into it. Or in this scene that I showed you, he, there's a shot of the moon and he's talking over it. And this gives him the space within the film to reflect. And of course, everything is very carefully constructed and he takes on the role of this very self deprecatory kind of loser. And I think that's why we even, uh, he's forgiven a lot in the film because otherwise, you know, uh, they would constantly be charges of, uh, you know, uh, sexism against him. I mean, for, for good reason, right? That he's objectifying the female body. But the way he constructs the film is that things happen to him because he has the camera and he's just like this kind of unwitting, you know, follower of life. So, uh, so this insider outsider role really works to his great advantage in that film. Um, and now uh, I, I'm just going to go ahead to my last segment and my last film. I know we are already an hour into it and then hopefully we'll still have some time for questions. But um, so I think the filmmaker, you know, can be inside the film and outside the film and is all, always to some extent in both places. Uh, and I'm very of late. I'm very, I've become very interested in uh, the omniscient third person camera. So uh, moving away from first person filmmaking, I'm very interested in the third person omniscient camera, which is the camera of fiction film, but it's used in the documentary. Uh, so uh, to give you an example that would best illustrate this, uh, I, I want to talk about the work of uh, the Italian documentarian Gianfranco Rossi. I don't know if you've seen Fire at Sea, um, a, a film uh, made uh, 2017, I think, if I'm not mistaken. A beautiful film. Um, and uh, before that, he made Sacro Gra. Uh, he's also made a film called The Boatman in India. But uh, anyway, I wanted to sh uh, show you a, a two minutes from um, Sacro Gra. So Sacro Gra is the outer ring road that circles the city of Rome. Uh, and what uh, Rossi does in this film is he chooses and documents different lives and different events along that ring road. So it's a kind of road movie uh, along the ring road. Um, and uh, what's very interesting in the film is that uh, well, what I saw in the film is that uh, because the ring road is on the outskirts, the lives are also on the outskirts. There are a lot of immigrant communities who live there who don't quite fit in. I guess in the center of Rome, there's a nightlife that happens on the ring road, which is sex workers and transvestites, transgender people. Uh, you know, there's an ambulance worker who's, whose job is to always be on the outskirts and pick up people who had roadway accidents. So it's very much life on the outside. And what Rossi does is one of the places, uh, spaces he films is an apartment complex uh, with these five apartments, one on top of the other. And uh, his camera is just fascinating, uh, where he decides to place the camera. It's always with, at the same angle and always looking into, uh, into an apartment in a very specific uh, way. So um, let me uh, just show you that scene and then we'll Te l'ho detto, tu ti preoccupi più di me che sono la diretta interessata. Non c'ho proprio ragione. Eh sì, mi preoccupo anch'io, mi preoccupo. No, perché così Ma stai solo con una preoccupazione, perché tanto no, se no. non è destino che io trovi questa persona o chiunque, a poi che non esiste una per giorno ad oggi, ma non esiste una persona sola. Se non è destino, se è destino che io trovo l'uomo della mia vita quando io ho 50 anni, è inutile che tu ti preoccupi. E così è scritto e così sarà. Tu puoi scalciare quanto ti pare, ma non servirà assolutamente a niente. Uffa, ti dovrò stare da presso. Senti, io altri 50 anni non intendo procedere. Quindi a un certo punto mi congederò dalla vita mm. e a questo punto mi rendo conto di una cosa. Ti dovrò stare alle calcagne per chissà quanto. Mm. Grazie della fiducia. Puro spirito o qualcosa di analogo ma senti perché invece fai il fantasimo questi... invece perché ti fai questi bei discorsi da padre dell'ottocento te vai a dormire mm. 
<ride> eh, dai su, ti sei lavato i dentini, sì? Quasi. Che mi tocca sentire a quest'ora della notte? Ma che ora della notte? Devi prendere la pastiglia, eh? Mancano Penso. dieci minuti. Ah, allora... Prendiamo anche la pastiglia. No, prendiamo la pastiglia. Cosa prendiamo anche la pastiglia? Prendiamo la pastiglia? Se no te, te la faccio prendere a forza. So, when, you, when I see a Rossi film, I sometimes feel in some scenes like I'm watching fiction. Uh, this could be a script. This could be two people, two actors. The camera is stationary. It's not handheld ever. He's, he loves using the tripod. And here, because of the way I descri described Sacro Gra to you, he has chosen this outside view. He's looking at, at this apartment from this canted angle. I think deliberately through the very form, making a statement on the content, which is what I find so fascinating. But at the same time, he's completely an insider because how we know that is we know the sound is so clear. So obviously he's not taking sound from that angle. He's obviously inside, he's mic'd them from the inside. And that immediately tells us as a documentarian, he has spent a lot of time getting to know this father and this daughter. He's invested in their lives. You know, he's not a peeping Tom looking in. And this kind of work I find totally fascinating now because, uh, I, I mean, I teach a course called Documentary Fiction uh, at NYU. I've been teaching this for 12 years. And for me now, the fact that the camera takes on this third person omniscience, but, is, but the documentarian is so engaged, I find just, you know, very, very powerful. And uh, again, uh, so these are just slices of life. We see this father and daughter several times in the film and every time all it is, is a slice of life. But that is what our work is as documentarians, is to present a slice of life. So I'm going to stop there and now move into the comments and uh, you can tell me how long we have. Here's our first question, all right. Um, could you talk a little about the accessibility and permission while filming Eyes of Stone? Uh, so um, th this was uh, very uh, interesting because um, I could not, I did not take permission from any human beings. Uh, I had to take permission from the goddess herself. It was as difficult as that. Um, we started at the temple and uh, I, I had to get, when I went to the Pujari saying I wanted to film, they said, well, we are no, but nobody here can give you permission. You have to ask Pankya Mata. Uh, she's the goddess. Uh, who I, I think there was a shot of her. I don't know if you were able to see it. So I, I asked, what is the protocol? How, how do I seek uh, uh, her permission? And they said, well, yeah, you have to come to the Arti. And during the Arti, you pray. And uh, there's, a, there's a steel thali in front of her. And uh, you, when you stop praying, you open your eyes. And if a neem leaf has fallen onto the plate, then me, that means yes. And if the neem leaf has not fallen, then it's a no. So uh, you can imagine my I state. I didn't understand that. Uh, that was Bixby just saying she didn't understand that. Um, I know it is quite incomprehensible. But anyway, I, um, I, I went and I prayed really hard at that arti uh, and I opened my eyes and sure enough, there was a neem leaf there. And that, me, that meant I had absolute support of everyone at the temple, and that included all the families that visited the temple. Um, okay. So I think, uh, Farid, I think I did sort of answer your question. You're asking me, um, if a filmmaker becomes an outsider, then how is personal filmmaking, filmmaking possible? I think you're always playing two roles. 
you always are inside your film, but you also have to step outside enough to be aware of your audience in order to make the film as accessible, personable, urgent, important to them. Uh, it can't be in your head. So you are constantly playing those two roles, and particularly in the editing process. Um, so um, any, any other questions? Uh, Surabhi, thank you for your comment. Um, extraordinary level becomes ordinary. Um, could you speak a little to your gaze that informs the compassionate way you allow us, the audience, to enter this unfamiliar world? Um, I think you can't help but be, but feel completely compassionate because you hear these stories again and again and again. And I never sort of boldly state anything in the film, but um, I, I discovered so much, learned so much about Rajasthan, you know, in those three years of making this film. Uh, child marriage is rampant, right? I mean, Shanta married at the age of 10. Um, I always think of that when I had children and when, you know, my with my 10 year old uh, who, and then she, Shanta becomes a mother at the age of 11. How can you not feel compassionate? So, I mean, the thing is you, you feel, uh, you have to go beyond compassion. You have to go beyond all of those things and um, just come to them from where they are at. Where are they in their lives right now? And I have to say there was a, there was a great deal of humor too, you know, I just love this, the creation the way women have created the, this goddess figure in their lives. Because sometimes anything that went wrong, like the dal had burnt or something, you know, God forbid. And then the mother would say, oh, we have to call Bhankya Mata to come fix it. Or, you know, uh, we have a direct line to Bhankya Mata. They would always say, we have a direct line to her. She will come and sort out our problems. Um, so there was this kind of, uh, it, the difficulty of their lives and Shanta's life in particular with that husband of hers whom you meet later in the film and her in-laws and all that but you know the kind of humor and the kind of space that women had created for each other with this goddess this goddess figure in their lives I think that was um, that was what you know made everything made the extraordinary ordinary to me and so I could be at that at both those levels um, if you have to comment on documentary realism today, what would you say, An Anugam? Um, uh, I don't know what we actually mean by documentary realism. You know, I have to say what I lose my patience over is uh, this kind of uh, what we've, we've entered a realm of heavy editorializing in the documentary. Um, uh, I think I think you'll know what I of all filmmakers will know what I mean. I mean, it's like nothing must be left uncertain or unqualified or un or, you know just leave things a little bit abstract or a little bit vague for God's sakes. Let the audience step in and engage with the material. Uh, everyone sort of I mean the trend now is to have a kind of very clear message and you everything in the film reinforces that message whether it's camera whether it's sound whether it's script whether it's the music it's archival footage it's um, uh, and I it just just bores me frankly it just bores me to death I have to say um, I'm sorry to be you know but after all I'm like I turned 60 this year so I think I can vent I'm allowed to vent. And I just long for films where I can just, uh, where I have the space to just be able to look at something and, and to be able to react to it and to allow a piece of footage to resonate in me at different levels without being told how, what to think. And, uh, uh, and so I find, and I find this very much in, in the West, you know, this kind of editorialized documentary. I find it I find that Europeans again, you know, uh, do different things. And that's why I'm so, I, I just love Rossi's work for that, for that reason, because he, uh, he works in a different way. Um, uh, okay. Um, the, the names of the films I showed and referred to, I can maybe CDC can uh, share those later. Um, and maybe we can even, I don't know, 
write it on the clips that would be but it was eyes of stone which is my film le maitre fou which is jean rouge a uh, nirne by pushpa rawat anupama shrinivasan and uh, sacro gra by jean franco rossi um but uh, again i don't know anugan if i answered your question on documentary realism i mean i think uh, at some level you know rossi's film is completely realistic right i mean we are seeing an unedited take between a mother uh, between a father and his daughter speaking about he's worried about her being 50 and not having found a man and she is worried about him taking his pill and they're kind of squabbling but the but the kind of intimacy it's completely realistic but it's the angle his way of looking at that scene which which we see it at a totally different level his his framing is so different uh, and we are allowed to pick what we want from that scene you know we can uh, we are left with it um <clears throat> Okay so uh, could you speak more about Rossi's ways of working in terms of to what extent he may have influenced the subjects into opening up honestly or how would he have ensured that they stayed genuine so this is a very interesting question tushar because I, uh, what do we mean by genuine right i mean the moment i think uh, uh, what the camera does is the moment you are aware there's a camera on you there's a certain aspect of you that is elicited of course Uh, the performer in you is elicited right uh, and i'm i'm not saying that these two people are performing i'm not saying that because he we see the father and the daughter several times in the course of the film and she is always there that computer that is her spot and he is usually by the window and he is a very kind of erudite man who's often talking to himself because she's busy and she's not even listening to him okay but you see them very often enough so that you know that is his character and that's her character but of course they are aware that here is a filmmaker who has obviously mic'd them indoors who is there on that stoop filming them so there has to be that heightened sense of awareness when they speak to each other at some level right at some level and i think that works to our advantage really and it's not untrue that doesn't make it untrue that makes a uh, A, a different reality come out to the surface i mean uh, but he actually invested a great deal of time with these people he spent about two and a half hour, uh, years making this film and he went back again and again and knew these people very well but it's the way he chooses to film them which i find wonderful there's another scene later on in the same film sacro gra where the um the the uh, the person who works in uh, in an ambulance he is at home with his mother and the camera is at a distance it's very dark and the uh, now the son and his old mother are sitting at the very uh, end of the frame and they are talking to each other you cannot see their faces you can but you can hear them clearly and it is so utterly moving because you realize as you're listening that she is deep in dementia and he the way he talks to her like he would talk to a child the way she talks to him there is something really remarkable there and at one point the mother actually turns and looks at the camera right but it doesn't matter i mean it doesn't matter what the 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 what the slice of life he's captured is so powerful and he actually says in an interview because you asked uh he also studied at the tish uh you know school of the arts here in nyu with one with an older professor who was european and the europe uh, and his professor told him when you make a documentary film never go and ask any questions don't ask questions because uh, uh, there's nothing there's nothing you'll get in an answer instead go and film life uh, and i just love i love that because that's that's the, the question is then how do you film life you know but i i think that uh, that that uh, speaks a lot to me um so i think that i've answered to share your question on how uh, rossi works um how to become a documentary filmmaker join cdc yes that's how you become a documentary filmmaker um actually India does have a lot of film festivals uh, Suresh 
uh, it's just that yes, I, I think I know what you're saying. The kinds of films that I am showing you, you probably will not be able to see. This is the frustrating thing about it. Um, you can see Nirne, it's, it's a PSBT film, it's on YouTube, watch it. Um, if you want to see Eyes of Stone, I'll send you a link. But you, uh, yes, it's, it'll be hard to watch Rossi's films. It'll be hard to, you know, watch other films. Um, Samira, thank you. Um, I think we're wrapping up. I, I, I hope we can fix this in the edit so that for other people who haven't watched it, it'll be more seamless. Um, okay, I think we'll sign off now. Is that good for everyone? I'm sorry if I couldn't take up every question. Is there any way to watch my films? Uh, yes. Uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll um, on Vimeo. Uh, I, I'll uh, I'll send you. I'll share the password with you. So for this weekend, Saturday, Sunday, you can watch Eyes of Stone. Um, uh, so uh, and uh, so that would be a good way. And I think there's a, maybe there's a way that I'll let Samira uh, and. Um, pass Mang and all know and they can share the, the Vimeo clip with you so you can see the film. Thank you. Thank you so much.